archaeological work and create educational programs. We recognize these indigenous peoples as the original inhabitants of this land. Uh, tonight, um, one of our many Bold Women Change History uh, lectures, um, this is our primary public forum for the Women's Vote Centennial Colorado, which began on the Capitol steps on Women's Equality Day on last August and will culminate in just two weeks as we reach the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment on August 26th. Only two weeks, which seems amazing. I know you are as excited as I am that this incredible and vital moment for our democracy, um, that we will be able to commemorate this moment. Please look for our emails to you about how you can take part in our Women's Equality Day commemoration. And most importantly, um, how you can participate what the next 100 years of women's leadership can be uh, we will be exploring that at our summit, the Bold Women Change History Summit, on Thursday evening, August 27th. We are so delighted that you're here with us tonight. Um, we, of course, miss spending time with you in real life, but one of the uh, kind of uh, silver linings to these is that we're able to uh, uh, be connected with people who are outside of the Denver area and, and welcome them as well. Uh, please, um, you can see in our chat, we always love to hear where people are from um, who are joining us. So please feel free to, to let us know um, where you're joining us from tonight. Uh, we, have re we just feel really honored um, that you are welcoming us into your homes tonight. Uh, so this Bold Women Change History Lecture Series is part of our inclusive statewide effort to commemorate the passage of the 19th Amendment. As many of you know, Colorado was ahead of the 19th Amendment um, by more than 25 years in the effort to remove gender discrimination from voting. Um, tonight's presenter uh, will help us even understand that more. Um, we know that the 19th Amendment did not happen overnight um, or in a vacuum and was one of the incredible steps in the voting rights battle um, that continues even into today. Uh, we are so delightfully engaged in commemorating this incredible history and connecting it to current events through our collaborative effort led by History Colorado, the Governor's Women's Vote Centennial Commission, and all of you. We are pleased as always that some of our commissioners are joining us tonight and applaud their support for this work. We also want to recognize the Chambers Fund Kathy McLean Finland and Richard Finland, Peter and Rhonda Grant, former Lieutenant Governor Donna Lynn, and the Honorable Wilma J. Webb and the Honorable Wellington Webb for their outstanding financial support of this effort. Please consider joining these leaders in support of this important work by becoming a member of History Colorado. If you have not already done so, head over to historycolorado.org slash membership to join any time. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, please note that we will be answering questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, please type your questions into the chat box at the bottom of the screen, and you can do that throughout the presentation, and we will uh, be collecting those and uh, be able to ask our uh, speaker tonight um, when she is concluded. So now I would like to welcome tonight's presenter. Tina Cassidy writes about women and culture. In addition to her book that brings her here tonight, Mr. President, How Long Must We Wait? Alice Paul, Woodrow Wilson, and The Fight for the Right to Vote. She is also the author of Birth, the Surprising History of How We Are Born, and Jackie After O, One Remarkable Year When Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis Defied Expectations and Rediscovered Her Dreams. She is a former journalist who spent most of her career at the Boston Globe covering business, fashion, and politics. And she is the Chief Marketing Officer for WGBH, the legendary public broadcasting organization that has given America such mainstays as Nova, Frontline, and Masterpiece Theater. Cassidy serves on the board of The Conversation US, 
and lives in the Boston area with her husband, the author, Anthony Flint, and their three sons. Welcome, we're so delighted you're here with us tonight, Tina. Thank you so much, Dawn, um, for that wonderful invitation. And uh, I also want to acknowledge the indigenous land that I sit on here tonight. I'm in, I'm on Narragansett land on the coast of Rhode Island, uh, which is uh, where I grew up, even though I usually live in the Boston area. So I'm in my Zoom room here, um, uh, which used to be a garden shed. <laughs> the lawnmower's gone. Um, and, uh, you know, I just, I feel uh, really sad that I'm not with you all in person tonight. History Colorado reached out to me so long ago uh, with this really great invitation and I've been watching your programming all year and it's really great. Um, so uh, tonight I am uh, going to share a PowerPoint presentation and a brief talk. Um, I will uh, share that for about 20 minutes or so. It will be interspersed with some readings from my book and then I would love to have questions from you. So feel free to share those questions in the chat as we go, as they come up, and then we will get to them all at the end. All right, I'm gonna share my screen. Great. So, um, four years ago, this very month, in this very town where I'm sitting right now, I was on vacation at the beach and I uh, was really thinking about, um, trying not to think about the election. I was trying to have a little bit of a break. And I was uh, scrolling Twitter uh, just to get the morning headlines and I saw a hashtag for Women's Equality Day and I had no idea uh, what that was all about. And I dug a little bit deeper and realized that it marks the day in 1920 when women uh, won the vote. Uh, I hadn't learned very much about that growing up, even though I'm pretty well educated. Um, and I think it's pretty common uh, for us not to learn about this story in, in our history classes. So I decided to write a book about it. So what I'm going to uh, do here is first talk a little bit about Alice Paul and who she was. So she was a Quaker from New Jersey and her parents instilled in her uh, this belief that uh, really it was their Quaker belief that everyone is equal. She was educated at a time when women generally weren't and she wanted to fight for social justice. So she went to a Quaker Institute in England where she could study more about it. And there she met the Pankhursts. The Pankhursts were a family of women, uh, a widow named Emmeline, whom you see here being carted off, uh, her daughters, Sylvia and Christabel, and they were the leaders of the more militant suffragette movement. And I'll just pause to say that the term suffragette was uh, a derogatory term that men applied to women who were fighting for voting rights. The women themselves sort of adopted it to take the sting out. Um, in America, that term was a little less common I generally use the term suffragist, uh, but in England, we can refer to them as the suffragettes. So they were part of the suffragette movement there. These were women who, you know, while some may have thought that they were militant, these were women really speaking out for voting rights. They were organizing marches uh, for votes for women. Alice Paul saw them and was captivated not just by what they were doing, but by how they were treated in response. Um, they were arrested and harassed, and she was so outraged that she put her life on hold to join them. And in those couple years in England, she learned everything she needed to know, mostly outside the classroom, to advance the women's movement in America. She sailed back home to get a master's degree at the University of Pennsylvania and decided to join the American suffrage cause, which was stuck in a rut. So in 1913, Alice Paul obviously wasn't even a lawyer yet. Uh, she'd received her first of three law degrees in 1923. And at this time, she was a student and an activist. She knew that the laws were stacked against women and her master's um, uh, thesis from Penn was called Toward Equality. And it carefully picked apart all the laws that made women property of men. So if you can imagine, you know, women couldn't own land, uh, if they got a divorce, uh, they would lose custody to their children uh, or their home. 
they were unable to have their own bank account even until the 1970s without having to have a man uh, sign for them. So these were all the ways that laws were stacked against women. Every state had its own rules that kept women lesser subordinate citizens. The old school suffragists like Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, they did not believe that there was a chance that we could get a federal amendment. And so they had been persisting around this idea of getting voting rights at the state level. So as you can see here in this map, by 1913, uh, they had made little progress since the Seneca Falls Convention of, of 1848. For example, women only had full voting rights in those six states uh, pictured in white here, all out west, Wyoming, Colorado, Utah, Idaho, Washington, and California. So pretty amazing that Colorado was the second state um, to give full voting rights to women. Um, note the states that did not allow any uh, voting rights for women, all in black. Um, we'll make reference to that again before the end of this program. So this is why Alice Paul believed it was time for a new strategy, a federal amendment. She joined the main suffrage group, which was called the National American Woman Suffrage Association, or the National American for short. And she tried to agitate within the existing framework for a new approach. At first, the National American humored Alice Paul and when she asked them if she could organize a suffrage procession, and this would happen the day before Woodrow Wilson was inaugurated in March of 1913. So on that day, uh, March 3rd, 1913, Alice Paul made history. On the left, you can see Inez Milholland, whom Alice Paul chose to lead the parade because frankly, she was not just a brilliant lawyer and active suffragist. She was also young and beautiful, the opposite of the stereotypical suffragist. Alice Paul was nothing if not sharp when it came to public relations, but her strategy was not seamless. While the parade was successful in generating attention, it did reveal some deep divisions. And this is one of the first parallels between then and now that I would like to discuss, and that is how racism spoils democracy. I'm gonna read a brief packet, a passage from my book about a very important moment in the march and hopefully clarify some misperceptions about it. A little bit of background here. Alice Paul invited African-American women to participate in the march. Indeed, a famous uh, black sorority called the Deltas was organized uh, with the specific purpose of marching uh, with this organization. But when word got out that she had invited them to participate. There were many white suffragists who did not want an integrated march. Um, some were worried about um, you know, a racial backlash. Um, others were just racist themselves and there was a great deal of concern. So I'm gonna read a brief passage here. The college section featured 1000 females in their academic robes, Paul among them too humble to march up front with the National American Woman Suffrage Association leadership, holding banners for Swarthmore, Bryn Mawr, Vassar, Wellesley, Smith, Goucher, George Washington, Radcliffe, Michigan, and Cornell. Howard, a historically black college, was also represented with a contingent of nearly 40 women of color. Most of them were members of the Delta Sigma Theta sorority founded the previous month for the purpose of the march. Women of color also marched within the labor section, portraying massive wage inequality. The toll of women helps to make the nation rich, one banner emphasized. A float carried dirty, disheveled women and children bending over sewing machines. Paul deliberately arranged the 39 non-suffrage states behind this group in alphabetical order, beginning with Alabama and ending with Wisconsin. In the middle of this lineup was the Illinois contingent, a group of 65 that included Ida B. Wells, a prominent African-American journalist who years before had exposed the widespread horror of lynching and had sued the railroad successfully for not letting her sit in the women's car. She had also helped found the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People in 1909. While the march was a shocking and radical act, the likes of which had never occurred in America, Racially integrating the procession was even more so, and it almost did not happen. Earlier in the day, when the Illinois women lined up for a practice drill, their leader, Grace Wilbur Trout, saw Wells and questioned whether she should be there. Her racist comment shocked the group, sending a buzz through the crowd. Some were so embarrassed they were speechless. Trout explained herself by saying, quote, 
Many of the Eastern and Southern women have greatly resented the fact that there are to be colored women in the delegations. Some have even gone so far as to say they will not march if Negro women are allowed to take part. She blamed the decision on the leader of the national as well as on Alice Paul, who had sort of backpedaled in a little bit of a passive aggressive way, um, saying <clears throat> that she would stop inviting uh, women of color to participate. Trout looked around for approval and found some, but another suffragist, Virginia Brooks, came to the defense of Wells. We have come here to march for equal rights, Brooks said, adding that, quote, if the women of other states lack moral courage, we should show that we are not afraid of public opinion. Wells was deeply hurt by Trout's remarks and let slip two large tears, which she wiped from beneath her veil. Quote, if the Illinois women do not take a stand now in this great democratic parade, then the colored women are lost, Wells said before storming off. At some point after the procession began, Wells jumped back into the Illinois delegation to march in her rightful place, while black women also marched with the Delaware, New York, West Virginia, and Michigan sections. There was one group, however, that was segregated in the back. When word spread that Mary Church Terrell, a prominent African-American, would lead a strong showing of the National Association of Colored Women and that Southerners threatened a boycott, the men's section offered to march between these black and white groups. It's interesting uh, for me uh, to think about the allies in this, um, including men. Of course, it was men who were in power, who had the vote, who would have to be the ones to be persuaded to grant the vote to, to women. And there were certainly men who were involved in the suffrage parade, um, which was really great. So in addition to the racial conflict after the march, uh, Paul formed a committee for a federal amendment and tried to raise money for it, but the National American kicked her out. They viewed her as competition. They thought she was becoming too radical. And so Paul was left on her own, having to build a new organization from scratch. So protest, uh, then and now, um, so many parallels. So if we think about all of the conversation that has uh, happened in the last few years around protest movements, whether it's taking a knee during the national anthem um, or chalking the sidewalks, often people will say, you know, that's not the right way to protest. It's disrespectful or it's unpatriotic. They certainly said that to Alice Paul as well. But to clarify, she did not call the march to the White House a protest. She didn't even call it a march. She called it a procession and it was meant to be a thought-provoking display of the contributions women make in society. There were no provocative signs aside those asking for voting rights for women. But it didn't matter what form their protest took. The Wilson administration and his supporters were really outraged, not about what the suffragists were doing, but by what they were demanding, voting rights. And I'm gonna read another short passage here. Um, about all of the creative nonviolent protests that Alice Paul employed over Woodrow Wilson's first four years in office um, that still made people angry. So this scene begins um, with a group of suffragists leaving the White House. And one really interesting factoid is that uh, Woodrow Wilson came to office as a so-called progressive. Uh, he was not progressive on social issues, but he certainly was on um, other reforms. And one of those was government reform. He wanted to bring more transparency to government. So back in 1913, you could literally knock on the door of the White House and say, you'd like to speak to the president. So Alice Paul exploited that little loophole um, many times and drove Woodrow Wilson absolutely crazy. So in this scene, the suffragists had just gone uh, to see Wilson and they're coming back from the White House and walking over to Cameron House, which is uh, was their headquarters um, right in Lafayette Park, Lafayette Square, right across from the White House. The women slowly made their exit from the East Room of the White House and returned to their new headquarters. After four years of toil and hardship in the damp basement on F Street, the National Women's Party and the movement Paul reignited was finally in a sunlit place of prominence. Cameron House stood at 21 Madison Place on the edge of Lafayette Park in front of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. The building, a wide three-story brick townhouse, had several benefits. 
First, it was visible and just 200 steps away from the White House. Wilsons could see the suffrage flag fluttering from its perch on the third floor balcony. Second, there was ample space to work and entertain guests from tourists and strangers walking in off the street to catch a glimpse of the women to those attending ever expanding fundraisers. There were also bedrooms to accommodate Paul and others, eliminating their daily commute. Paul was now using Susan B. Anthony's old desk, a Victorian cylinder roll top that Anthony's secretary had donated to the National Women's Party. And that was the organization that Alice Paul created. She thought if women could not be a Democrat or a Republican, they should have their own party. When the indignant suffragists walked through Cameron House's front door, they entered into a great hall with a large staircase and a fireplace that burned eternal. Paul was there waiting for them, ready to stoke their anger as they dropped into comfortable chairs in front of the flames and asked the question again, how long must we wait? With the women assembled in front of the fire, Paul pitched a carefully orchestrated idea, which she asked Harriet Stanton Blatch to present. Harriet Stanton Blatch, by the way, was the daughter of Elizabeth Cady Stanton. She sort of peeled away from her mother and her mother's more conservative beliefs to join Alice Paul. That did not go over very well. So Harriet says, we've got to take a new departure. <clears throat> we've got to bring to the president day by day, week in, week out, the idea that great numbers of women want to be free, will be free, want to know what he's going to do about it. We need to have a silent vigil in front of the White House until his inauguration in March. Let us stand beside the gateway where he must pass in and out so that he can never fail to realize that there is a tremendous earnestness and insistence in back of this measure. So far, with Paul as their leader, the women had marched four years earlier in 1913 in one of the largest and most outrageous protests America had ever seen. They had assembled an 80-car brigade to deliver signatures from all over the nation. They had testified, editorialized, and reorganized. They had formed their own political party. You can see the car here where they drove cross-country on the left and on the, I'm sorry, on your right. And then on the left is, is Lucy Burns in a biplane dropping leaflets over Seattle. They had a booth at a global exposition, collected a miles long scroll of signatures and drove it cross country from San Francisco. They dropped leaflets from the sky and a banner from the house chamber's balcony. And they had sacrificed one of their own. On this day in front of the crackling fire at their new headquarters with the White House at their backs, they may have been exhausted, but they were neither depleted of ideas nor the passion to continue the struggle. The one of their own um, who they lost was Inez Milholland, who collapsed on a Western tour and died. That was the woman who was on the white horse at the front of the parade. They listened as Blatch offered a new form of protest. In America, pickets have become a common union tactic, typically ending in violence. But suffragists have been employing the practice as well. Blatch had used pickets in her Votes for Women campaign with the New York legislature in 1912. So when she delivered her final plea to the women of Cameron House, they stirred. Will you not, she asked, be a silent sentinel of liberty and self-government. It turns out that Washington thought women standing silently holding signs in front of the White House was even more outrageous. And it triggered a series of unwarranted arrests with sentences up to six months. Um, I want to acknowledge that there were uh, quite a few women from Colorado who participated in the pickets and were all imprisoned for it. And you can see their names here, Virginia Arnold, Natalie Gray, Caroline Spencer, all from Colorado Springs, Margaret Kessler of Denver. Um, there were other uh, women from Colorado who were involved in the campaign in other ways, including the African-American journalist Elizabeth Ensley. Um, another journalist from Colorado came up with the idea of uh, convincing newspapers to editorialize in favor of suffrage, which seems so obvious, but no one had ever done that before. Um, so Colorado was on the cutting edge in, in so many ways, which is really great to see. Of course, once uh, the women were imprisoned, they knew that they could generate even more sympathy if they went on hunger strikes, uh, which is what they did. You can see Lucy Burns here. She was uh, Alice Paul's number two, her sidekick. They had met in prison in England. Lucy Burns was from an Irish immigrant family living in Brooklyn, um, but had also been studying abroad uh, until Alice Paul convinced her to come back 
to America and join her. And on the left, you see an artist's depiction of force feeding, uh, which was pretty brutal and disgusting. Um, and so when word got out that these women were being treated so badly, it absolutely generated sympathy and kept suffrage on the front page of newspapers all across America. To protest the sentences, the incarcerated women went on hunger strikes and Alice Paul was committed to a psychiatric ward. So on the, in the picture on the left, the top right corner, you can see a little window that appears to be boarded up. Uh, that was where they kept Alice Paul. They were uh, claiming that she was obsessed with Woodrow Wilson and that's why she needed to be locked in the psychiatric ward. Um, that didn't last very long because that also uh, gained her even more notoriety and more sympathy. Her friends and other suffragists would assemble beneath the window and sing um, and call up to her uh, to try to keep her, her spirits up. Next, I'd like to talk about the Wilson era and the similarities between uh, that time and our current rise in white nationalism. One of the first things Wilson did after he was elected president was to segregate the civil service. As the first president elected from the South since Reconstruction, this move empowered white supremacists, triggered racial violence, including lynchings once again, and gave the Ku Klux Klan the boost it needed. In fact, Wilson is the first president to have ever screened a movie in the White House, and that film was called Birth of a Nation, which was about the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, it was a film created by a friend of his. Racism then combined with another uh, combustible uh, issue, nationalism, and then the First World War erupted. Uh, so Woodrow Wilson decided to clamp down on the First Amendment, attacking not just the press, but individuals who were criticizing him. And on the streets, if anyone saw seemingly able-bodied men, especially those with any kind of foreign accent, they would be dragged to the police and arrested. Um, they would be assumed to be spies. Otherwise, why weren't they off fighting in Europe? So vigilantes would beat them up, due process be damned. Going after those he believed to be seditious extended to Alice Paul and the rest of the silent sentinels. And of course, Russia played a role. Um, I'm going to read another passage here. This scene begins with suffragists arriving in shifts to their posts outside the White House gates to stand silently with their signs. I'll bet you can guess how this turns out. The next day, a car dropped off Lucy Burns, Dora Lewis, and their heavy cargo in front of the White House about an hour before the Russians were expected to meet with Woodrow Wilson at 1230. The women unfurled their 10-foot hand stenciled cloth sign stretched between two wooden posts, shuffled into position and straightened the banner between them. The crowd, many of them on their lunch hour, slowed to read the wording message. And it's what you see here on your left. As pedestrians processed the words, some scribbled to transcribe the banner, the situation grew tense. To attack the president so directly in front of diplomatic guests was an unprecedented outrage, not only for those witnessing the protest from inside the White House, but for many who saw it happening on the street, murmurs rippled through the crowd and cars stopped to take in the scene. The Russians arriving by motorcade passed quickly through the gate, but with enough time to see the sign. Bystanders, men and women alike, were enraged that the, that the delegation had seen the protest. Take down that banner or I'm through with woman suffrage for life, one man screamed at Burns. Lewis argued with the man as he stormed off and ignored her. You are a friend to the enemy and a disgrace to your country, one woman sneered at the protesters. Why don't you take that banner to Berlin? You are helping the enemy. But past is indeed prologue, and we have so much to learn from the suffrage movement. For example, when we're fighting for democratic ideals, we need to include everyone, or else we're not really fighting for democracy, are we? We're only fighting for some people. Change is hard and it can take a very long time. The first women's rights convention at Seneca Falls was in 1848 and it would be another 72 years before women could vote. And then not all women. Black women and black men faced disenfranchisement through poll taxes and literacy tests. 
the federal government did not recognize Native Americans as citizens until 1924, so they could not vote. Those of Asian descent couldn't become citizens and vote until 1952. And the Voting Rights Act meant to address all of the barriers to voting passed in 1965. And yet voter suppression continues. So there's always more work to do to make our union more perfect. Alice Paul knew this. In fact, her work didn't end when the 19th, when the 19th Amendment was ratified in 1920. Three years later, she wrote the Equal Rights Amendment, which passed Congress in 1972, but was never fully ratified by the necessary 38 states. Actually, there weren't. <clears throat> well, in the last three years, there's been tremendous progress. Illinois in 2017, Nevada in 2018, and Virginia in 2020 have all ratified the Equal Rights Amendment, becoming the 36th, 37th, 38th states. And women of color have been leading the charge on the Equal Rights Amendment. This is Jennifer Carroll Foy, who's running for governor in Virginia. Uh, she's a member of the Virginia House of Delegates. But what's really interesting to me is this map. And this map shows in white the states that have not yet ratified the Equal Rights Amendment. And doesn't it look very similar to that map of 1913 of the black states that did not want to grant voting rights to women? But the women pushing for the Equal Rights Amendment know that change is slow and the work never ending. And they take their inspiration from something Alice Paul once said, which is carry the banner always. So thank you, I'm happy to take any questions and I will stop sharing my screen. And if anyone needs me to go back to a slide, I will reshare. Thank you so much, Tina. Um, since I'm asking the questions, I always uh, take that privilege to ask my questions first. Um, I, I just kept thinking about throughout your presentation, a recent article in the New York Times that basically the title was something like, uh, the history of suffrage is not boring. It is the story of political geniuses. And, um, you know, some of your uh, presentation touched on this idea of this political genius of these um, women. Uh, how, how would you think uh, we could look back at this history as a history of political geniuses? Alice Paul was quite the political strategist. I often thought she was creative, indefatigable, and a real strategist before, uh, you know, that was something that you could imagine women being in the political realm. There were so many layers to the strategic thinking involved. I'll just start with Alice Paul for a moment. Um, you know, she really attacked this with a, a single purpose in mind, and that was passing the federal amendment. Uh, she knew she had to build a grassroots movement, even though the, the other suffrage organization was sort of coalition building at the state level um, because they didn't like her and didn't want to you know, be part of the work that she was doing, she had to build a new network. And just to think about the amount of legwork, the time, the effort, you know, in the time before broad access to telephones and you know, cars and forget about email, um, you know, it seems just so daunting. Uh, but she really, she built organizations in each state and uh, you know, started with that. She also relied on the Western states quite a bit, saying the women of the West can vote. Let's mobilize them to vote against the party in power, which was Woodrow Wilson's Democratic Party, um, to start to put pressure on that party to change their uh, minds about suffrage. So that had never been done before. And up until that moment, suffragists really believed that uh, they should be apolitical, as strange as that mm -hmm. sounds. Uh, they did not, you know, endorse Republicans or Democrats. Um, you know, they did not sort of frame anything in political terms. Um, she said, that's ridiculous. We're going to hold the party in power responsible, regardless of what party that is. Um, she also created her own political party, which meant that they could sort of fundraise and have their own political convention, which she sort of you know, packaged next to the other national political conventions for the Democrats and the Republicans that helped her get press attention. 
She also created her own newspaper called The Suffragist, which was a way of disseminating, it was propaganda, basically. It was accurate, it was real, um, but it was a way of getting out accurate information about suffrage at a time when mainstream newspapers, written mostly by men, were um, really condescending in their coverage. It was also a mechanism for her to fundraise. Uh, you know, women from all over the country would send in their quarter for their little subscription. And, you know, it was another way of getting them in on the cause. So, I mean, the, the strategy was great. If, um, I, if whenever anyone is free to travel again, I highly recommend going to the, um, the Belmont Paul house uh, in Washington, DC, where uh, Alice Paul lived most of her life um, after leaving Cameron house. And there you can see, uh, a, um, she had these little uh, index file cards where they would keep tabs on every single man in Congress and how he voted, where he lived, how to reach him, um, you know, where he had lunch and, and all of that. And you could just see the level of detail and commitment. Um, it was really quite astounding. I mean, they did not hire rich lobbyists. Uh, they were always on a shoestring. Um, so yeah, really impressive. Yeah, what are some of the things you think we could learn today um, that would still be applicable in our modern world um, that draw from these uh, political strategies? I think the key one is grassroots really works and that you can't build a movement from the top down. I think that we've seen attempts at movement building in, in recent years that have not worked so well. Um, but when you create that real grassroots momentum and you have women out on the streets um, feeling like they are part of something bigger than themselves, it snowballs. And then it, they take that home and influence their households and their friends and their families. Um, you know, African-American women were really good at this with church groups and their clubs. Um, you know, it was very much um, a person to person. You know, it's it was sort of the pre-Facebook Facebook approach. Um, and I think that that's essential to any kind of political success today. Yes, yeah, social, social networks before social media, right? Yes. <laughs> um, as, as you were going through your presentation and thinking about these dates, it's hard not to think about uh, something else that happened in 1918 that seems pretty relevant to today, and that yeah. is a pandemic. So mm -hmm. how did the pandemic, um, sort of intersect with this work that's going on around suffrage? Yeah, well, at exactly the time when uh, the federal amendment was moving forward, of course, there's a, there's a flu pandemic uh, that erupts. And obviously it was quite deadly and really scary. The women didn't let it get in the way. It slowed them down some, but you know, they were out there wearing masks and uh, being careful and doing everything that they could. You know, it also affected uh, Woodrow Wilson because he got sick in Europe, came back to America, sort of got him to, I think, see the end of his presidency in a new light and realize that he needed to get on board mm -hmm. and support suffrage or else his party was going to suffer in the 1920 presidential election, which it did, but you know, he, he knew that it was going to crush Democrats forever um, if he didn't get them to support it. Wow, interesting. Um, so uh, we have a question from the audience around um, what are some of the other uh, suffrage, I like to call them suffrage warriors. You talked about suffrage, uh, suffragettes and suffragists. I call them suffrage warriors. But what are some of the uh, kind of maybe more unrecognized uh, suffrage warriors that you think are fascinating and think that we need to know? There were so many in every state. Uh, you know, in preparing for this talk, I went kind of deep on some of the ones from, from Colorado. And it's interesting because as I was researching my book, you know, looking at primary source material and the and letters in the Library of Congress and you know, Alice Paul's personal scrapbook and, and all of that, you would see these names of other women and they get referenced in uh, her newspaper, The Suffragists and so forth. And tonight I was just putting some of those names and locating them in, in Colorado. Um, you know, I mentioned a few of them earlier, but um, you know, every state has these women. 
There's one in particular um, who I don't think has ever gotten enough attention and that's Mary Church Terrell. Um, she was an African-American woman who lived in DC. Her husband was the first black judge in DC and Alice Paul invited her to participate in the march. And then she also invited her and her daughter to participate in the pickets in front of the White House. And Mary did that. And I think, you know, it was hard enough to be a woman. It was hard enough to be a radical woman. It was insane to be a picket. And now you're a black woman picketing in front of the White House. I mean, the amount of bravery that that took is, is pretty mind blowing. Um, so I would definitely, call out Mary Church Terrell as one of those warriors who was fearless. And of course, Ida B. Wells too. I think we are beginning to learn more and more about her. There were also many women who were really active in suffrage before this time period that I focus on in, in my book. I really look at this period while Wilson was in office. So those eight years between 1913, 1920. Um, but even before that, you've got women like Harriet Tubman um, you know, just really putting herself out there uh, on, on this issue. So I, I also encourage whenever I give a talk to have women go, you know, poke around in their own family history, you might be surprised at what you find if grandma was a suffragist. I hope she was. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We've got a lot of um, ancestors to, to say thanks to for all of this. Um, so we had several questions about the ERA and it's complicated, right? Like, so I'll need your help here, but it, I believe yes. recently it has been ratified by all the states, but now nobody knows what to do. Um, yeah, well, so, um, so people know what to do. It's just a matter of making it happen, right? <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, there was this arbitrary time limit that was put on the ERA back in the day. And people thought it was unconstitutional then, but women also thought, whatever, let's just get this out for ratification because we're gonna get the votes. And then turns out they didn't get the vote. And, and so the ERA laid fallow for a really long time. As mentioned, the last three years, it's gotten new momentum, I think in part, just because women have become more active and also the Me Too movement has put a spotlight on the ways in which women are still facing discrimination um, in many places, but you know, also in the workplace. So there is legislation that has passed uh, that is in Congress that would repeal that time limit. And depending on, you know, even though I should just say, you know, that the ERA has always been a bipartisan um, piece of legislation. It was always supported by Republicans and Democrats. Um, and that has also been the case in this most recent round, but there is a little bit of a divide happening and people think that if a political divide, of course, people think that if the Senate flips in the November election, that the ERA could very well finally move, that that time limit will come off and then it will advance um, because that's really the only thing holding it back at this point. And then, you know, it would need to be certified. Now, yeah, there are some states saying we want to take our vote back. Um, whether that's feasible, who knows? I mean, this could certainly end up in the Supreme Court. So it's very complicated, but uh, there is also a clear path to victory on it. And most of the people involved at the grassroots level with the ERA believe that 2021 is the year. Yeah, it'd be Almost interesting. A century to see. since Alice Paul wrote. <laughs> yes. it. I mean, I just think how how prescient was she knowing that the vote was not going to be enough to uh you know to bring women to equality in america and she was right we we often say here at history colorado internally as we're doing this kind of work um you know we have to remind ourselves and sometimes are taken aback around how really justice and freedom are a journey like they're not someplace you arrive and then everybody gets to go home and, and celebrate and feel good forever. Um, but this idea of justice is a journey. I, I think I just keep hearing that theme from what you're saying, this idea of how these women so decades before 
the 19th Amendment are doing this work. And then this work continues in the form of the ERA for, for decades beyond. Um, so imagine, you know, we've got this incredible history, but, but what can you imagine for the future? Like, what does the next 100 years of, of women's rights and voting rights look like? Um, or at least what do you hope it looks like? It's a great question to ask this week. I certainly feel like there is a lot of change happening really quickly around women and women in power, women in voting rights, and um, you know just what it takes to advance women's issues. So you know, another century from now, I mean, <laughs> I, I am not. There is no way that I think we're going to have to wait another hundred years for a woman to be president. There, or you know, that can't possibly be. I'm gonna, I'm gonna place it within the next few presidential elections. Uh, so that would be pretty amazing. Um, you know, I recently wrote a piece looking at what happened after the 19th Amendment passed and what the last century has looked like, and I, I think um, it might be instructive uh, for this question. Um, first of all, uh, the first year that women could vote about a third of them did, but you have to imagine the muscle that they needed to build, the education, the learning curve, you know, maybe some of them didn't even believe in suffrage, but like, what do I do with this right? <laughs> I'm going to stay home and knit today. Um, but really, since then, women have outvoted men in a pretty dramatic way, and women also tend to vote um, more Democratic uh, than Republican. That's been true in recent decades. And of course, African-American women um, uh, turn out for Democrats in even greater numbers. There is also a misconception that women, um, there's this idea that you know, what, whatever the women's vote might be, that it is monolithic and it is not. Women vote along party lines and that is often tied to class and religion. And so, um, you know, so women are not monolithic. And I think that, you know, there are conservative women and liberal women. And uh, what is interesting is to see women across the political spectrum becoming more involved and, uh, you know, running for office really up and down the ballot. So just given the momentum where that is, I, I am certainly expecting to see parity, you know, in Congress, certainly a woman in the White House within, a, you know, all within our lifetimes. That's my hope. So speaking of that, we have a few questions about one big announcement that happened this week. Um, and my ears perked up when you mentioned Howard University and how there were women from Howard who were part of this march. Um, because now we have a vice presidential candidate who is a graduate of Howard University and, and a woman and a black woman. Um, there's also been a lot of incredible stuff written in the last few years about exactly what you were talking about, the grassroots organizing power, specifically of Black women. Um, so how do you think that, A, maybe this played into this particular vice presidential pick? Or um, how do you think, like, what kind of energy do you think it would give uh, Senator Harris in, in this race? I think it gives a huge energy to the ticket. And I think it is highly motivating to get out the vote. And I think that that's what this election is going to hinge on is who shows up at the polls. I think, you know, analyzing voting data from the last election, it wasn't about who liked which candidate best. It was more about who did not turn out. And I know that there's been tremendous work around uh, voting rights and voter activation and changing laws that have suppressed votes. There's been a lot of work that has been done to alleviate gerrymandering or redistricting, as it is also known. Um, you know, because that I often get the question, like, what, where is voter suppression happening? I don't see it. What is it? And even redistricting is a form of voter suppression because like, if you feel like your vote will never count because you're surrounded by people from another party, uh, then you kind of give up. So, um, you know, voter suppression is everything from, you know, closing polls due to COVID budget cutbacks in places like Kentucky, 
uh, to um, sort of, you know, crawling back a ballot initiative that was going to give felons voting rights. So it's, it comes in all shapes and sizes, um, but I know a lot of work has been done um, in recent years on that issue. So it's, it's gonna be a really interesting election for sure. Yeah, well, um, so something you said just a little bit ago around um, Alice Paul recognizing way back when that um, the vote was not enough. Um, I'm wondering uh, what your thoughts are on this idea, is representation enough? Like, is it enough to, uh, you know, for women, um, women's liberation or women's issues uh, to simply have women in elected office? Certainly not. Nope. I think it is the first step. Uh, and I think it's, it's related to this idea that, you know, whether you're a male politician or a female politician, you think that, okay, this is going to be an, this is how women want us to vote, or this is a women's issue. Um, and knowing that, you know, I think it almost takes a woman in, in office to know the economy is a woman's issue and the environment is a woman's issue. You know, it's not just about, you know, abortion and childcare. Um, there's a lot of stuff there and we, and we care about everything. We care about foreign policy, right? Um, we care about healthcare. So, um, you know, if you have, you know, I think we've all seen images of, you know, nothing but men around a table making decisions about women's health care that just doesn't feel right. You can't imagine the leaps of empathy and the blind spots that they could have about how policies they are creating could be affecting women. Having women at the table certainly helps, but you could have women at the table who, you know, behave like the men and have their own blind spots as well. So it is not a panacea, but it is certainly a first step. Great. Um, well, oh, it looks like we've got another question. Um, hold on a second. It's Campbell. Yeah. Um, so many you. great ones. Yes. Yeah, which I think speaks to this idea that this really, you know, we know some of these names, some of these names we have to dig through the old newspapers and and letters to find, but it really speaks to this idea that this was not a handful of charismatic uh, leaders, that this really was a collective, a network um, woven across the country that made this possible. Can you, like in just some concluding thoughts about what that means, um, why it matters that women did this in such a uh, collaborative, community-centered uh, way? Yeah, I mean, they did that, and they also made a lot of mistakes, um, you know, and, and, and it wasn't, uh, movements are messy, and leaders in the movement, including Alice Paul, weren't perfect, and I think that we need to take the good and the bad lessons from, um, you know, such a momentous occasion like this. You know, as we look back, even on the founding of this country, we have to take the good and the bad. Um, I think what is essential and why I am so excited to think about celebrating the centennial this month is because it gives us all an opportunity to learn that history, to critique that history, to ask questions about it, to ask what would I have done? Um, would I have picketed in front of the White House? Um, you know, would I have driven that car cross country? <laughs> um, would I have done any number of things, right? I mean, I think, and we can all ask ourselves, what can I do now to make sure that our democracy uh, stays a true democracy or becomes a more perfect democracy? We have a lot of work to do. Um, but I think, you know, it's inspiring for me to think about what one individual can do to make change. Um, however imperfect that change might be, you're absolutely right that, you know, um, progress is not always a straight line, and, uh, but you have to start somewhere, and you have to keep going. <laughs> yes, never give up. That's right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Tina. We are so delighted that you have been able to join us tonight from your Zoom room, um, and uh, one of my delightful teammates has been sharing some great links in the chat to some of your writings. Um, particularly, I, I think we're all now really interested in this piece that you've written recently um, 
about um, what what happened right after um, the 19th Amendment. Uh, so we've got a link in the chat for that. Okay. And thank you. Um, yes, just thank you. Uh, thanks for sharing all of your wisdom with us tonight. And thanks to everybody at home for, for uh, joining us as well. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thank Good night. you all. And get out and vote. Check to see when your primary is. Have a plan. <laughs> and thanks for having me. Have a good night. Absolutely.